they're destroying the country. This is this is a system that cannot maintain itself. It's inherently unstable. In one guise or another, it has failed throughout the history of the United States. And here are Supreme Court decisions that uphold the supposed legitimacy of the irredeemable paper currency, which is being used as the substrate, if you will, of this banking system. Here at Liberty and Finance, we're licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. We are standing by the inventory, ready to make sure you get what you need, even into the wee hours of night and on weekends, because preparedness doesn't stop. Call us, 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're delighted to have this returning guest. Dr. Edwin Vieira is a doctor of jurisprudence and PhD. He's a constitutional attorney. He's been with us several times in the past talking about issues of government overreach and constitutionality and the real role of the people uh, as the government, the proper government of our own uh, country and as sovereign individuals. We've also talked with Dr. Vieira about his studies and writings about the role of gold and silver as the true foundational, the constitutional foundation of our currency as uh, called out in, in before the formation of our country, in the Constitution, in the Coinage Act, etc. And now a new movement among the many states around the, the country trying to get back to silver, for one thing, as legal tender. Dr. Vieira, thank you for joining us again this Monday, January 24th, 2022. Well, it's my pleasure to talk to you again. You wrote the book, Pieces of Eight, and you've spoken with us in the past, and we'll put a link to that in the description of this video about some of the Im un <laughs> unbelievable, uh, reasonable, and common sense, and good for the ordinary person principles and reality and historical roots to silver and gold as being the, the foundation of our United States currency and even before that, but uh, there's been a great loss of the, that foundation, and we are now adrift with, at the, at the uh, mercy of fiat currency and, and the debt-based system that it brings. Several states have, are taking matters into their own hands and declaring uh, silver for one to be legal tender uh, for settling of, of debts in, uh, with the government in their, in their states and so on. You've been in touch with some of these groups. You may have even advised some of them uh, from a legal standpoint. Could you talk to us about what you see happening, why you think it's important, why we need to be aware of it, and where you think it's heading? Well, understand that these movements in different states are initiated and led by people who already have some understanding of the constitutional and sound economic role of precious metals as currency, as money. So we're starting with a, a limited audience or clientele who are behind this. It really has not reached the level of what I would call a general political issue. And there are two or more facets to this particular uh, gemstone. One is the concept of actually bringing gold and silver back as a medium of exchange for the states and the people within those states. Uh, and that really relies upon the idea that at some stage a state would adopt gold and silver as one of its media of exchange. Initially, this would not be to uh, remove Federal Reserve notes from the system, because politically that would be very, very difficult to do, uh, at least initially. But to create a set of competing or alternative currencies. So that's one line of approach, a line of attack. The other which has seen, I think, more success is the notion of simply allowing individuals to choose to use gold and silver as their medium of exchange without 
some of the impediments that have been imposed. And the primary impediment has been taxation of one form or another, either in the acquisition of gold and silver or the exchange of gold and silver, particularly coin, United States coinage for Federal Reserve notes back and forth, those, those types of transactions. And that really started, or, or the, the movement on that track really started, I think it was in Utah many years ago, when they passed a statute that declared that United States gold and silver coinage would be legal tender in the state of Utah. Now, in a sense, that was superfluous because all of the statutes dealing with coinage of United States coinage, as well as, of course, the bank notes, Federal Reserve notes, national bank notes, declare those things to be legal tender. And under the Supremacy Clause, Article 6 of the Constitution, there was no way that the states could uh, deny that declaration. They certainly couldn't say the negative, that United States coinage was not legal tender. Uh, So their addition of kind of a a state rubber stamping to this, saying the state will treat these as gold, uh, gold and silver will be treated as legal tender, was uh, essentially superfluous. Now, it wouldn't have been superfluous if they had taken a couple of other steps. And one was to make it easier for people to acquire and exchange gold and silver United States coinage for Federal Reserve notes or the opposite. And they did that in some instances. Some of the states removed and are still doing it. They're removing uh, taxation on those kinds of transactions at the state level. Now, of course, there's nothing they can do with respect to that problem at the federal level. What the, how the IRS treats these kinds of transactions. Uh, typically, they treat them as kind of capital gains transactions when you're exchanging U.S. gold and silver for Federal Reserve notes, short term or long term. Um, or they, they treat them as kind of a complex income calculation when it goes the other way around, when you're receiving gold and silver coin say, in payment for whatever your income status would be. So the states could deal with the taxation problem within their own jurisdictions, and that was good. So they had those two elements, uh, usually in in separate statutes. The first statute was always, we're going to treat United States gold and silver coinage as legal tender within the state of X. And then later on, people were working on the removal of these uh, tax barriers to the efficient use of gold and silver coinage. Well, that's fine, because if you do that within the state, let's forget for the moment the the federal impediments to the use of gold and silver in normal transactions. But looking within the state, that's fine, because it now says, well, we're not going to prevent you as a normal individual from acquiring, from procuring gold and silver coinage, and we're not going to penalize you in some way, through the tax system at least, for using this coinage. And so it is possible, in principle, and we're also going to recognize the legal tender character of it, so you can make contracts that will be enforceable in the courts under the legal tender concept. So it is conceivable that there could develop an alternative monetary structure based upon individual choice in economic transactions, normal, everyday economic transactions. So that's a possibility. But I don't see if that has gone very far in terms of actually uh, instigating or aiding in the development of an alternative currency system. Probably because the vast mass of people simply have no idea of the kinds of problems we're talking about here today. All right. Gold and silver coinage to them, the United States gold and silver coinage, is something that has no particular meaning except perhaps as an investment vehicle or to buy a coin to give it to someone for a you know, birthday present or what have you, wedding present. The vast majority of people have no understanding of this. They have no historical knowledge of the monetary system in this country or especially the monetary system in conjunction with the banking system because the two are yoked very closely together. So as a result, uh, this is a very arcane subject, 
And I think to the average person, it's it's probably as uh, appetizing as eating gypsum board. It's not the kind of thing the average person really cares to listen to. So I don't think they've gone very far with that because of that particular obstacle, the lack of education. And of course, you'll lay that back on the school system for one reason or another. Now, another element in this is, of course, the, the state involvement in the transactions. Because most of these statutes that I've just been talking about don't involve the state except in terms of its recognition, the recognition of the statutes that U.S. gold and silver legal tender coins will be legal tender within that state. All right? And the removal of taxation barriers to their acquisition and use. But these statutes don't talk about the state using gold and silver as an alternative set of currencies. Or even uh, set up a mechanism for doing that. And then there's another problem that's built into this is that if you look back historically, there were a number of questions that were, that arose subsequent to 1865, the end of the, the war, dealing with the question of the relationship of paper money to gold and silver United States coinage, because you still had circulating, they had circulating at that time, the U.S. greenbacks which were actually irredeemable until 1875, I believe. And the question is, well, what was the interrelationship between this paper currency over here, the irredeemable paper currency, and U.S. gold and silver coin, which is a situation we have today. We have Federal Reserve notes, uh, national bank currency as well, but Federal Reserve notes make up the huge percentage of the actual paper currency. And they are irredeemable in gold as a matter of law, and they're irredeemable in silver as a matter of practice. You simply, you can take a Federal Reserve note to a bank and say, redeem this in coin, and they won't give you a silver American uh, liberty. They'll give you one of the base metallic coins or a handful of the base metallic coins. And they certainly won't redeem any of their currency in, in gold. So you have the situation that was similar after the Civil War, an irredeemable paper currency and then gold and silver, which was still United States legal tender coinage, and some people could use and were using in what has come to be called gold clause contracts. And those were and are contracts that specify that the payment must be in gold, usually specifying what coins and how many. And they can also be silver clause contracts or combinations thereof. And you can write contracts of those types in this country that are still enforceable in foreign gold coins or foreign silver coins. And there we, again, we look at that and say, well, how many of these have I ever seen? Very, 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 very few. Because most people have no understanding. But if you go back to the post-Civil War, immediate post-Civil War era, there were a number of Supreme Court decisions which had to make specification, if you will, I have to specify what this interplay was. And they upheld gold clause contracts as being enforceable. That was the first thing. If you had a gold clause contract, uh, the, the, the debtor party could not, through the courts, require the creditor party to receive paper currency. And as well, the damages that had to be paid, if you had a contract breach and the court issued damages, those damages had to be paid if it was a gold cost contract or silver cost contract, had to be paid in gold or in silver, not in paper currency. So there were a number of rules that were set up for making gold clause and silver clause contracts really enforceable so that the full value of them would be transferred uh, to, to, the, to the parties. So that's one of the problems I look at with these state statutes that have come out making or recognizing U.S. coinage as legal tender within what state of Utah, whatever state it is, they don't address the problem of how their own courts are going to enforce contracts that are made payable in this gold and silver currency, which the state has declared to be legal tender. And what I see the problem there is that the judges are no more uh, educated 
about this subject than anyone else, really. I mean, they came out of the law school the same way I did. And when I went to Harvard Law School, we never discussed this series of very important cases, economically at least, uh, dealing with gold and silver clauses, contractual clauses, uh, which were found, by the way, up until the 1930s, from certainly from 1900 on, they were found in every issue of United States bonds and in state bonds, in private bonds, railroad companies, insurance companies, whatever. They all had gold clauses in their instruments of indebtedness. Why? To convince the people to buy them because they would be assured, that is, the buyers would be assured that they would be paid in essentially full value and not be handed a fistful of depreciated paper currency when those bonds or other contracts came due. So the problem is, you may have a statute in a state that says, oh, we're going to recognize gold and silver United States coinage as legal tender within the state of X, and we're going to assist in people's uh, use of that by removing these barriers of taxation. But then you go into a court in front of some judge trying to get the good result, the proper result in the enforcement of the contracts. And of course, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And there's no statute that tells him what he has to do. So it'll be a question of the lawyers arguing these earlier Supreme Court decisions way back when dealing with the United States currency and United, United States paper currency and uh, gold and silver coinage. And one thing you know is in those types of situations, there'll be an argument on one side and an argument on the other side. And it is not at all inconceivable that the judge will make a mistake or be like Solomon, threaten to cut the baby in half, except he will cut the baby in half. And you'll end up with a lot of uh, lower court decisions, at least, which will be inconsistent with the correct law on the subject. I think that's one of the mistakes that these states have made. They have not put in specific provisions in a statute that essentially tells the judges, here's what you have to do. When a contract of this kind comes in, in front of you, you have to enforce it specifically as the terminology is used. That is, you have to make the payment in the medium that the contract has specified. You cannot give damages in some other medium, such as Federal Reserve notes, bank credit, or whatever. And so that's, I think, a mistake, a uh, lack of uh, foresight, if you will, on the part of the people that have promoted these statutes. They didn't realize, wait a minute, these things are no good unless the people can actually use gold and silver coin as their normal economic media of exchange. And they will only do that if they have an anticipation that if they get into some kind of contractual dispute, the courts will enforce these things in the right way. And given the lack of knowledge in the courts, I mean, I'm talking about Supreme Court decisions that were from the 1870s, all right? So it's 100 and, what, 150 years ago. Uh, so you wouldn't expect, and as I say, I went to Harvard, we didn't discuss any of these, these court cases. So you can expect that there will be problems in the local courts, the state courts. And unfortunately, the statutes don't deal with that. Now, looking at the other alternative, which is the actual state adoption route. And I've been involved in that. I wrote statutes. Drafts, drafts, of course, they would never adopt it because we ran to run one political roadblock or another. Uh, but basically, they said that the, the statute said that the state would begin using gold and silver as a medium of exchange for the payment of certain taxes. And that's how the state would get her hands on the gold and silver coinage. So the statutes I drafted used a tobacco tax in New Hampshire, and then there was one we did in, in, in uh, Montana. And the reason for that was the tobacco tax is one that targets only a small number of taxpayers. They're companies that are the importers, if you will, the distributors of tobacco products within a particular state. And that's that tax is is the type of tax that I think most people would look kind of askance at and say, well, that's fine. You know, tobacco is one of those things that is now being frowned upon. And OK, you're going to tax those people, not in, the, in terms of increasing the taxes, just in terms of telling them they have to pay whatever the tax is in gold or silver coin 
of the United States. And actually, the statutes that I drafted, they could pay it in almost any gold and silver coin. They had a whole list, opened it up. So there's no greater burden on them. Politically, they're not in a position to uh, gain a lot of support against that kind of a statute. And so the idea was that those people would pay in that amount of tax. I think in, in New Hampshire, it was like 10% or so of the total taxes. They took 12%. It was not too large, but on the other hand, it was not too small. And this would be put in a separate account, a gold and silver account. And the state would then offer on a first come first serve basis to its creditors payment in gold or silver. So you would have state contractors or private contractors work with the state. The idea was they would be coming forward. Some of the smart ones would come forward and say, oh, we have a, a debt here that is owed to us and we want you to pay us in gold and silver pursuant to this statute. So there would be a kind of circular flow. Gold and silver would be coming in from the tobacco tax and then it would be going out to the state creditors. And then those state creditors, what would they do with that? Well, they wouldn't put it in a box somewhere. The theory was they'd start offering that in private transactions. And slowly but surely, and of course, the, 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 the tax of the tobacco people would have to obtain gold and silver. So they'd have to go into the regular economy to obtain the gold and silver to pay their tax. And so you begin to get a circular flow. And at some stage, the state treasurer would come back to the legislature and say, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm running out of gold and silver within the first month of the receipt of these tobacco taxes. There's a terrific demand on the part of the creditors to re be paid in gold and silver. I want to increase the tax base. And so the legislature would start looking around for other taxes that they could make payable in gold and silver. And slowly but surely, you drive the system further and further in the direction of use of gold and silver as an alternative currency. And it would have the protection of the state in this process because, of course, the state's collection of taxes or other dues is constitutionally protected against interference from the government of Washington, D.C. Government of Washington, D.C. has absolutely nothing to say about what the state declares to be the medium of payment for its own taxes. Then the next level was to go further. It actually, was part of part of the process of the statutes that I wrote. The state depository would be set up to hold the gold and silver, separate from you know, various banks in which they were holding their, their their paper money credits. And this depository, at some stage, one hoped, would become open to transactions simply among people in the normal economy. That is, you could get an account in this depository, you as a private citizen, and use the depository to pay or to receive gold and silver from other private citizens. So now we'd have not simply the loop going through the state treasury, but there'd be this subsidiary, or I would imagine at some point much greater loop going through the state depository. And the beauty of that was, well, of course, the state depository would be a state agency. It's outside of the normal banking system. So it would be entirely separate from, independent of, and protected against interference by the U.S. government. And we'd have a real alternative currency, protected by the state because the depository was a state agency. And protected by the Constitution because Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1 says, no state shall make anything but gold and silver coin of tender and payment of debts. So the states have this reserved, explicit power in the Constitution to do this. They simply haven't done it, and they don't have the mechanism for doing it. Uh, so one bright spot here was Texas, or is Texas, because as I'm sure many of your listeners know, Texas set up a specie depository. Texas had a fair amount of, I think it was just gold, uh, outside of the state that was part of their teacher's pension plan or whatever, they had some, some state employee pension plans. And they became a little leery, the legislators became a little leery of having those assets outside of the state of Texas. 
So they passed a statute creating a Texas state depository and repatriated, as it were, all of that gold into Texas. And as part of that, the way they set it up was that it could be used as a kind of banking facility. People depositing gold and silver and then people having transactions that the, that the depository would main, you know, maintain the records of. And you can imagine all this would be done electronically. And this would have tremendous potential because let's say you put in a certain amount of a certain weight of gold, whether it's in coinage or bullion. And that's interesting. It's constitution. If you, if you look at the Supreme Court decisions, Supreme Court decisions really treat bullion and coinage as fungible. Uh, bullion is simply non-coined gold, but has been stamped in some way as to its uh, amount and purity. Whereas the coin has simply been stamped with this impression that tells you what the amount and purity is for a hand-to-hand -hand transaction. Whereas bullion usually doesn't leave the depository, it's just a matter of changing the ownership records. So that would be the way, in a modern system, this depository would work. People would put in coins or, or bullion, and you'd have a unit, the arbitrary unit, the dollar, 371 and a quarter grains of silver, and then an arbitrary amount of gold, which is the way this originally started was they called the gold eagle, uh, which was not considered to be a quote unquote dollar. It had a value in dollars in the marketplace, but it was a separate thing. And the computers would simply tell you who owned how much of the stuff, coinage or bullion that was in the depository, keeping those kinds of records. And one thing we know about computers is they don't care how many zeros come to the right of the decimal point. So we would no longer be bound by the difficulty that coin in the coinage system, you have only a certain number of coins of a certain weight or certain weights. And what happens in between? That's where you get token coinage. That's where you get the idea of, of checks that are written with you know, decimal point, uh, so many cents afterwards. All of these uh, uh, methodologies, which eventually lead you further and further the direction of what I would coin the, call the, the fiat currency fallacy. But now is the first time really in world history that we could make a gold and silver system work, I won't say perfectly, but uh, approaching perfection, because now with computers, to maintain the accounts, you could make a gold and silver payment for a candy bar. Well, you know, candy bars cost a dollar, I suppose, these days, but whatever, right? But on a nickel, nickel's worth of whatever it would be, a jelly bean, right? You could pay with a gold and silver credit card, a gold and silver depository card, not a credit card, depository card, right? Because the computers will simply transfer ownership interest to whatever that amount is. And it could be a thousandth of a grain, could be a ten thousandth of a grain, could be a hundred thousandth of a grain. Computer doesn't care. Right? So we could make this thing work the that way, as a, in a practical matter, much more so than was ever possible under the old coinage and even bullion systems. And it would be protected by the state in a state depository, which was an agency of the state. And gold and silver would be declared to be legal tender for use in gold clause contracts pursuant to a state statute which which was supported by Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1, no state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. All right? So you could make the whole thing work. And a couple of years ago, I was talking with some people in, in Texas, and one, there was a special session of the legislature, and we drafted a bill to deal with this kind of a problem and the gold clause contract problem. Because remember, every one of these transactions going in and out of the gold depository, gold and silver depository that I'm hypothesizing would be a gold clause contract situation. Right? Payment of so much from so many, from, from so and so to so and so. Okay? So I drafted some statutory language to deal with the problem of the courts. And we began to work out how this gold depository that Texas already had, Texas was setting up, would be used by private citizens and corporations and so forth in normal transactions. And that was another situation that didn't get too far because it was a special session of the legislature 
And it turned out that that piece of legislation, again, was blocked somehow. So that's what I've run into. These ideas which advance the concept, go beyond the concept of simply declaring gold and silver coinage a legal tender in a particular state, they've run into political roadblocks. And those political roadblocks, I think, are facilitated by the ignorance of most people, including the legislators. I don't know how many legislators I've talked to that, you know, they just give me a blank stare. You know, the deer in the headlight stare when start talking about this particular subject. But the point is that some of these statutes have been passed. And at some point down the line, some people are going to look at them and say, well, what's the next step? Okay, we've made these things legal tender. So what? Are people using them? Well, maybe they're not using them because uh, the courts don't understand what the situation is and they're not giving proper decisions. Oh, so we need to do that. We need to tell the courts in a statute how to apply these and enforce these gold clause contracts. Uh, but we can't do that very easily because most people don't have a means. They don't go to the Wells Fargo Bank. They don't go to Citibank. They can't go to whatever these the normal banking institutions and get a gold deposit or a silver deposit. You can't have a silver deposit checking account or whatever, gold checking account, a credit card. You can't get a, you know, a city card bank, uh, payable in gold, payable in silver. We need to do that. That's the next step. We need to do something there. Oh, can we depend upon these private banks to do that? No, we can't. Can we depend upon the Federal Reserve? Absolutely, we can't depend upon the Federal Reserve. They're 150% antagonistic to this idea. We have to go the state depository route. Oh, okay. Oh, there's a statute that was written, I don't know how many years ago. Well, it was the the bush Kerry election. It was the time of the bush Kerry election, the statute I wrote in New Hampshire. You tell me how long ago that was. That's almost back to Civil War times. Uh, But here's a statute. Oh, and here's a statute, similar statute was written for Montana. Oh, we can just do it. And here's a, a, a depository structure that has been set up in Texas, very complicated statute to make sure that the thing was properly controlled. We can use that for our our state depository. And we can just tweak these statutes a little bit to fit our own peculiar legal code in state X or state Y. And lo and behold, we will have the beginnings of an alternative currency system separate from the private bank, separate from the Federal Reserve, separate from the U.S. Treasury. And because it is being run by the state government, as a part of the state government, the people in Washington, the U.S. Treasury and others, cannot interfere with this. We have what used to be called intergovernmental immunity, in the same way that Congress can't interfere with the state legislature. Treasury Department of the United States can't interfere with the state treasurer, the executive branch of the state government. So at some point, I suppose somebody will, as they say, glom onto this idea and put all the pieces together. Difficulty, once again, come back to that you know, magic word, education, knowledge. A tremendous amount of knowledge has been lost over the years simply because it isn't taught anymore. The average person has no conception of the history of, let's just say, the Federal Reserve, let alone the history of the United States gold and silver coinage let alone the relationship of those two or anti-relationship in the case of Federal Reserve to the U.S. Constitution or the state constitutions in many instances, which you could rely on one way or another. They're not specific on this subject, but you could certainly use the, you know, the general powers of a state legislature and so forth to justify these statutes. Uh, so that's, that's a major problem right there. I've talked to a lot of, you know, years ago, used to go to these economic conferences and there would be lawyers there, and I don't know how many times I've run to and economists as well, who said, "Oh well, you know, you can't use gold and silver coinage as, as tender and payment of debts. You can only use Federal Reserve notes." <laughs> and I think about that. I think to myself, "Well, what are these people? How illiterate they are? If you simply go to the statutes, Title Thirty-One of the United States Code." 
where it lays out the coinage provisions dealing with the American Eagle set of gold coins, dealing with the, the Liberty uh, silver coins, and a lot of other coins that have been generated, gold and silver coins have been generated over the years. And it specifically says that these things are legal tender, even in the United States statutes. And that means that if you use them in a contractual setting, have, essentially have what I call a gold clause contract, that that is the medium of payment for that contract period. End of discussion. The contract cannot be paid in paper currency. So not only can you use them, but you can make them exclusive in such a contract. And I don't know how many economists, and I'm talking not not, not these you know economists that are advising the present regime in Washington. I'm talking about real honest to goodness economists and lawyers who will tell me in my face, oh, no, you can't do that. <laughs> I just have to chuckle, you know, and tell them, well, go read Title 31 of the United States Code dealing with coinage of gold and silver, the United States gold and silver coin. See what that says. Right, okay. So that's, one of, that, that's, the, that's our major problem. Now, in a way, if you look at what's going on today, you have all of this brouhaha, People up in arms about what they call inflation. And what is that? Well, they're worried about increases in the price of gas, increases in the price of food, whatever, whatever the commodities are, substances are. And of course, we know, I'm sure the vast majority of your listeners know, well, that's not inflation. Inflation is increase of the money supply, money and bank credit supply, currency, the debt that can be turned into currency. And price increases are not inflation. Price increases are the, perhaps, the consequence of inflation. You can certainly have price increases because the supply decreases of some good. And supply and demand, price will then go up. That has nothing to do with the monetary phenomenon. It's just, you know, maybe the mines were flooded, and so you couldn't get any more germ germanium. Right? So as a result of that, the... Uh, the electronics industry products prices have to go up because the supply drops off. All right? It's not a monetary phenomenon. But if you have general price increases, or it's also conceivable to imagine a situation where you have no price increases, where prices are dropping, but they're not dropping as fast as they ought to, that's a monetary phenomenon. That's because more money has been injected into the economy with no increase in the supply of all goods and services. And that's the whole problem of a fractional reserve central banking and then the linkage of fractional reserve central banking to the U.S. Treasury so they can turn debt into currency. There's an old problem. This goes back to the Roman Empire and debasement of the currency. Different me mechanisms for doing it, but same result. So people are looking at this, what they call inflation, and saying, we don't like this. I can ex understand why. And then they're making all sorts of claims about what part of the program of this, you know, the Biden regime is responsible for this. And the answer is, well, it's 1913. It was Woodrow Wilson. It was the creation of the Federal Reserve System. Now, I can go back a little earlier than that because we have the National Banking Acts, 1863 and 1864, created the national banking system, which is still with us. Right? A lot of these banks are, big banks are national banks, and the national banks are part of the Federal Reserve system. So the problem, maybe you could even say it extends all the way back to the first and second banks of the United States, way back in the early 1800s this concept that the bankers and the big financiers wanted was a centralized control over money and credit. Their centralized control over money and credit. And it was Alexander Hamilton that put forward the thesis, political hyphen economic thesis, that the treasury as much as possible should align itself with the interests of the big financial houses because this was going to support the creditworthiness of the government. Whenever the government needed money and credit, 
which you couldn't get by immediate taxation for obvious reasons. It could turn to the big financial houses and banks, and they would support the government. So he wanted an alliance of the U.S. Treasury with the financial, the high-level financial sector, or the low-level, depending on which way you want to characterize it, but the big money boys in Philadelphia and New York at the time. Now, of course, it's primarily New York, the Federal Reserve in Washington, D.C. So this goes all the way back to the beginning of the bloody country. And if you want to take it back to the Bank of England, was 1684, the deal that was made with William of Orange? Uh, really, there's a long history of this, but in this country, it, it's primarily 1913 because that was the creation of the Federal Reserve, which is still the dominant force in banking and finance. And people don't understand that. They don't understand the Federal Reserve when it started out was on a gold standard. There had to be a reserve, a really large reserve for deposits and a large reserve for the currency, Federal Reserve notes. And the banks had to redeem those notes. And if they didn't, the Treasury had to redeem them in gold. And then you come up to the Depression, and the Federal Reserve was set up in 1913 to end all inflations and depressions. That wasn't going to happen anymore. And a couple of years later, after World War I, 1920, 1921, they had a depression, and then, of course, the big depression coming in the late 1920s, 1930s. So it didn't take more than 20 years for the system to fail. But it was based on a, on a gold reserve standard. And then, of course, you have the famous seizure of gold by Roosevelt goes off the gold standard domestically. And then Nixon, later in 71, goes off the gold standard internationally. And already by then, Federal Reserve notes, the Treasury was not redeeming Federal Reserve notes in silver. So after 1971, you have a real honest-to-goodness fiat currency. Fiat, let it be currency. It isn't, but they just say it is. And it was a world reserve currency because of World War II. Right? The British were the British the British were bankrupted by their arms payments financing the war. Uh, Germany and all of civilized Europe was prostrated. Even Russia, Soviet Union, uh, everything up to almost up to the Volga had been leveled. Uh, same with Asia. Asia didn't have much in terms of wealth. It was a colonized situation or the corruption of China. But once they destroyed Japan, all of Asia was in that state. So the United States is the only country that comes out of this in a more or less pristine economic position, dominant. And Federal Reserve note, the Bretton Woods Agreement, most of your listeners know about that, it becomes the world reserve currency. Well, the problem with that is, it was the same problem that we had with the various central banks in the history of the United States. They were based on fractional reserve principle. They overexpanded, as fractional reserve banks tend to do. They became uh, insolvent, or the threat of insolvency weakened them. You had economic crises, financial center crises, which spilled over to general economic crises. And the systems went into a, a political crisis mode. First bank, second bank, national currency system set up under Lincoln, Lincoln administration during the Civil War. And that was the first real cartelization and direct tie of the banking system to the Treasury. And that didn't work. A number of bank panics, the big one was when, 1910, 1911. And out of that comes the Federal Reserve System. The idea was it was supposed to end all bank crises within the United States by being the lender of last resort. It would always be there to create currency out of debt to bail out a profligate banking system. Well, all right. But the problem from a world point of view, a world currency system is the Federal Reserve System is the bank central banking system of a single country. And obviously, that's not going to work in the long run for a world system because the interests of a particular country will always be put ahead by its politicians 
of the interests of this, you know, world community, global community. And the globalist ent- entities, the big corporations, corporations, they see this too. Uh, so they would very much like to get away from the Federal Reserve as the controlling element in their uh, essentially currency slash debt scam and put in something else that would be more amenable to internationalist or global control. So that's one of the problems that's lurking here behind the scenes is here we have this system which is entering an inflationary period, serious inflationary period. How are you going to correct it domestically when there are international forces that don't want to see it corrected? International forces that want to, as it were, usurp its role. And maybe some of those international forces are not entirely international. I mean, maybe they're, you know, the Chinese have interests in becoming more dominant, maybe making a, a, a situation where there are uh, multipolar currencies, more than one major reserve currency. Who knows what their strategies may be? But we come back to the American people and say, well, what do we want to do? Let's forget this, you know, these, these globalist pie in the sky concepts. They're not certainly not going to save us. We'll be even less capable of controlling our monetary destiny when decisions are made in some central banking mechanism in Zurich or wherever it would be. How do we control the situation here? And that, I think, brings us back to the alternative currency route. I don't think you can take the Federal Reserve tomorrow, even, even if you could get a majority in Congress and a president who would sign the legislation. You can't simply re- replace a huge, complicated banking currency and investment system with a huge level of debt based on a fictitious currency unit. You can't do that overnight. No statute can be drafted which will do that overnight. In fact, any statute that would attempt to do that would, I think, generate a tremendous amount of upheaval, economic upheaval. While it was being debated, not even, let's forget about when it was enacted, while it was being debated, what do you think the markets would look like when they saw the present group of people in Congress, AOC and others, debating a statute to replace the Federal Reserve? There'd be chaos. And that's one of the reasons I think the, the courts, especially the Supreme Court, have dodged every question that has come to them, even from the 1930s, dealing with banking and currency because they know that if they do anything in the direction of declaring the system invalid, not the whole system, just a part of the system, they risk creating economic and political chaos because a judicial decision can only say this part of the statute is bad. It can't tell Congress how to correct it. It certainly can't force Congress to correct it. It kicks the can back down the road, and now there's a there's a hole in the statutory structure and the economic and, and political operations with respect to money and banking. And suddenly this huge committee of disparate opinions and interests and subterranean manipulation, heaven knows what, is left with the task of filling that hole correctly. And I can see how any judge would look and say, well, we don't want to take these cases. Because if we open that door and the chaos that ensues will be laid at our feet, we'll say, well, the court did this. The Supreme Court caused this problem because you wrote this stupid opinion. You should have left it let sleeping dogs lie. Leave it alone. So it's not going to be corrected that way. And I don't think it's going to be corrected through Congress either, whichever way you do it, whether the Supreme Court kicks it back to Congress or somebody brings it into Congress through the front door. Congress is a talking shop. They have no way of correcting this. In fact, more likely than not, they'll do what they've always done, turn to the experts. Oh, let's listen to whatever the uh, head of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System tells us needs to be done. Banking is one of those areas of expertise, the great administrative state that we have talked about in the past probably more so than others, other areas of the administrative state where Congress is going to simply 
Yeah, as long as you're continuing to support our Treasury spending, Mr. Bank, we'll support you. We'll listen to whatever you tell us to do. So that brings me back to these alternative statutes, alternative currency approaches. Those things will set up a structure, if they were done correctly, which people will slowly adopt as their mechanism for making first, I would think, big level financial transactions, corporation to corporation, long-term contracts, because they want to protect against currency instability. And then that will filter down to Ma and Pa Kettle, and they'll have their gold depository credit card or whatever, and they'll buy bread with it, cans of beans in the grocery store. And that will be a slow enough process so that there will be equilibrium. You're not going to have some major spike up or down in the system, number one. And it will happen at a rate that's commensurate with the you know, the willingness and the understanding of the average person to participate in it. And on the other side, the banks, well, it'll be slow enough so if the banks can look at this and say, well, we can't fight it because legally there's no way to stop this from from happening. State set this up, that's the end of that. We better begin to look to the possibility of our participating in this as well. Can we compete against those state depositories and earn whatever the reward is going to be, the income from the running of the deposit? The depository is not going to run, you know, people are going to have to pay some fee to use a depository just the way they'd pay some fee to use a bank. So the banks begin to say, well, we need to set up gold and silver accounts of our own so that we can take advantage of this new market that's being opened up. And that would lead, I would think, to a lot of banks becoming potentially solvent and others going under, which is the way the market works. Now, your problem, of course, is the U.S. Treasury, maybe a lot of state treasuries as well. U.S. Treasury, it depends absolutely on the Federal Reserve System for these huge outpourings of Fiat, fiat money, fiat currency values, right? They don't print the money, but it's electronic. So what's the U.S. Treasury going to have to do? Ah, well, you see the same process. Some people in Congress are going to look at this and say, we have a problem. We need to set up some kind of interface with the gold and silver markets instead of fighting this. Oh, and there will also be international implications as well. See, so the whole thing could, it could feed on itself if the states would set up the complete system, it's not enough simply to say gold and silver coin will be legal tender. They are already a proclamation from the state of whatever, Missouri or Utah, whatever, doesn't make them any more gold and silver, any more legal tender than they already are. But then the problem becomes using using that legal tender in day-to-day transactions by the average person, the average businessman, and that requires to say you have to have the practicality. There has to be an institution that enables you to make those transactions like a bank. And so this would be the state depository. And that institution has to be protected against interference from the U.S. government. And it would be if it were a state institution. And then you have to have the uh, expectation, the hope, that if something goes wrong in your particular contract, that your local courts will know how to deal with it properly according to the right rules. And so make the gold and silver coin contract provisions effectual. You don't want an interference of the courts that will cause you to take paper currency or bank credit instead of gold and silver. And once you do that, see, once you have it insulated from interference from the U.S. Treasury because it's a state institution running the depository, and once you have the state courts controlled by a statute to tell them this is how you have to interpret and enforce these kinds of contracts, or else that'll be an impeachable offense, you'll be removed. So that's the key. You've got to, as it were, point out to them. If you try to interfere with this business, you know, you're going to have to go and become a used car salesman again. We're removing you from the court. 
But once that's done, now you're probably 90% of the way to a real alternative system. Now, what's the 10%? The 10% is Ma and Pa Kettle. That is the private citizens who are engaged in these kinds of transactions. And is the U.S. Treasury, Internal Revenue Service, going to come in and say, ah, well, these are taxable transactions according to our federal code, our federal statutes, our federal regulations, our federal court interpretations. So, yes, you can use this alternative gold and silver currencies. And yes, you can use a state depository, but we're going to inhibit as much as possible the practicality of this by continuing to enforce or maybe inventing new uh, tax impositions of one kind or another, reporting impositions of one kind or another. Right? On you as individuals, we're not going to try to go after the state depository. We're not going to go attempt to go after the state treasurers. We're not going to go after the state courts because we have no jurisdiction over the state courts. We're going to go after you, Ma and Pa Kettle, as individuals. And that's where we get back to the point that I made many times the militia. You know, Second Amendment is the example. Well regulated militia being necessary to security of free state. Stop right there. What's a security of free state? Well, it's almost anything you can imagine. And one of the things that you could imagine, you wouldn't even have to imagine, you know. Security of a free state would depend upon economic security, right? Most people don't feel secure if their economic status is in constant upheaval. Well, one aspect of economic security that's very important is the currency you're using in day-to-day -day transactions. What's a free market? Free market is one in which people, through transactions, set price levels and so forth and so on, and those are always expressed in monetary units of one kind or another. Free market economy is a market economy based upon ultimately some medium of exchange expressing prices. Prices being determined by the transactions of, of private parties. So it's clear that you have to have a stable monetary system in order to maintain the security of free state. Well, uh, would that then be a role of the militia? Well, one might think so. And so who would control this depository? Well, that would be a militia function. And in terms of Monpa Kettle out there, the state would say, I think, you're all members of the militia of Virginia. Everyone from 16 to 55, you're all members of the militia. And here's what we want you to do. In order to have a, our stable economic system for the security of our state, Everyone out there has to get one of these accounts in our gold and silver depository. Now, we don't care whether you use them, just the way you could get a checking account in Gizmo Bank, private bank, use it or not use it. But you have to have one so that you're capable of dealing with this system. And that's part of your militia duty. And then you people who are actually in the economic world buying and selling, and that would include, uh, you know, lawyers and doctors that are setting hourly rates, or that would include people at barbershops or supermarkets or whatever. You're required to post two prices. What is your Federal Reserve note price? Because that's the currency that is being used by the U.S. government. And what is your state gold and silver price? Or gold and two prices, gold price, silver price. And you're required to post those. And you're not required to have your customers use gold and silver exclusively. At least not now. Not yet. But you're required to allow it. To offer it. Because we want to, as quickly as possible, establish an alternative currency operation throughout our state. All the way down, not just the state economy, the economy of the state government, but all the way down to the private economy to Dale's, you know, bought a hardware store. So that we are protected against the vicissitudes of a collapse of the Federal Reserve System. We are protected against the vicissitudes of an attempt by external forces to impose some world currency upon us. And you're required to do this. 
because you people are members of our militia, and so that's a governmental function you're performing. So when the U.S. Treasury comes to Ma and Pa Kettle and says, ah, you know, you can't be doing this, blah, 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 giving some kind of regulatory mumbo jumbo, Ma and, Ma, pa, Ma and Pa Kettle say, well, we've been required to do this as, as part of our membership in the state militia, which is a state institution, over which, by the way, U.S. Treasury, you have no authority. And the state is going to back us up on this. So it's not a matter of the U.S. Treasury versus individuals, isolated individuals, legally naked, as it were. It's the U.S. Treasury attacking the state institution, which is part of the entire alternative currency structure, or really the what I would call the ultimate protector of the entire state alternative currency structure. Now, that's what I would like to see, because it would bring everybody into it. But you have to go sequentially, I think. And they've made, they've made the first halting. It was like baby steps, right? Watch that baby standing up and then holding on to the chair or something and finally releases both hands from the chair. Uh, the baby's about to take the first step. That was the, I guess Utah was the first step, state that did it. That was the Utah gold and silver legal tender bill. Now, practically meaningless because gold and silver United States coin are legal tender whether Utah says yes or no. But it was the first step by a state to say, we are going to take some affirmative steps on our own to move in a direction away from or become an alternative to this rotting vegetable Federal Reserve currency system. And then the next step would be the creation of the depository, the collection of some tax in gold and silver with uh, the old, at the other end of that process, the payout to the state creditors. So you've got a, a flow through the state treasury and the gold cause contract provisions to deal with. The, and that's all, I mean, this is a lot of this is very simple. The gold clause control over the courts is very simple because all those pr pr uh, principles have already been written out, worked out by the Supreme Court in dealing with the uh, greenbacks, the paper, irredeemable paper currency of the Civil War, and U.S. gold and silver coinage, and a series of cases that came up after the war. So we already have that. That's easy enough, and I've done that. We've already put that into draft statutes. I call that a nothing. That's really trivial. So you put legal tender provision, control of the courts with respect to gold cause contracts, and that, that, that statute would recognize gold cause contracts as protected by state laws. So that magic language would all be in there. And then the next step, of course, would be the facilitation of gold cause contracts by the state depository, the state gold and silver bank. And you tie that in with the use by the state of gold and silver through collection of initially a small amount of the you know, total tax input. And that would increase and increase and increase. That's the idea. As if, if this system worked, if this system were superior, so we have this, we're talking about a scientific experiment here. If this system were superior to the present system of fiat currency mediated by fractional reserve central bank, then more and more people would choose to use it. And then this would increase the ability of the state to tax more and more people or more and more segments of the economy in gold and silver and to pay out gold and silver to state creditors. And you can see the thing developing in a direction of exclusivity. All of a sudden you find out that people are using Federal Reserve notes only as if it were a foreign currency. You'd have to have a contract written to be paid in Federal Reserve notes in order to be enforced in Federal Reserve notes. It'd be the exact opposite of what we have now. And it would all be done incrementally through the market. The market pressure would either do it or not do it. But you've got to give the market the tools. And those tools are a couple of statutes and an actual depository. And then the state using the depository initially to collect taxes and pay out to creditors in a relatively small amount. You've got an experimental level. You don't you know, you jump to the highest level of throughput, as it were. So that's that's it. And it's certainly workable because, it, it, in a sense, it's the reverse of what happened before. Right? Before, the, the currency was gold and silver coinage, period. 
banknotes were never considered to be legal tender. And you might have a contract that was payable to the notes of Gizmo Bank way back in the 1830s. But if you went into court and got damages, the damages would be paid in gold and silver, the currency of the country, not in the paper money of Gizmo Bank. So the whole thing has been reversed. The, the banks and their friends in the Treasury and the big financial houses and bucket shops in New York have turned this whole thing around, which is I mean, it's obviously you look at it and say, well, this system that they have now couldn't possibly be constitutional. Look at it. It's the exact inversion of the constitutional system. Yes, it is. Well, now, how do you, how do you change it? Well, how long did it take them to change it to what we have now? All right, forget the first and second bank of the United States pre-Civil War because they're gone. But the national currency banks, national currency system, the national banks within the national currency system, they're still here. They're part of the Federal Reserve System. So we're talking something from 1863 and 1864 when those statutes were passed. Then 1913 for the Federal Reserve System. Then the abrogation of payment in gold, 1933, 34 end of gold cost contracts. Abrogation of payment in silver basically was 1965. Abrogation of international payments in gold, 1971. Look how long that process took up to today. So you can't do the inverse of that. You can't reverse that process overnight. And the difficulty becomes, of course, besides education, if you're working on this incremental program well, what's the other side going to be doing? The other side will be trying to stymie you, go into the federal courts if possible to say, oh, this is invalid under some treasury regulation, blah, 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 whatever. And do whatever they can to throw a monkey wrench into the gears or sand into the gears, whatever you know, metaphor you want to use. Which is what they've already done. I mean, I give you the example of the statutes that I wrote. They were stopped by political manipulations within the legislatures. It wasn't a matter of some grand debate over fiat currency versus gold and silver. It was manipulations, party manipulations. Okay, So you have that problem. And that's why I would tie the whole thing back to the militia structure, because at that point, all of these machinations disappear, and you get immediately to the constitutional question. Now, the only way that, that last example I gave, the only way the U.S. Treasury can interfere with Ma and Pa Kettle when Ma and Pa Kettle are asserting a militia immunity is to raise that question. Do you really have this immunity in order to do these things? Let's go all the way back to Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1. No state shall make anything but gold and silver coin tender and payment of debts. Immediately the constitutional question arises. There's no way out. And the beauty of it is, in, in, in a practical sense, from the judiciary, looking at the judiciary, for the ju judiciary can say, oh, yeah, we can, we can uphold this thing on constitutional grounds. Why? Because it doesn't represent an immediate threat in the same way as the judiciary said, oh, we're going to declare the Federal Reserve System unconstitutional. Right? This alternative currency is there. It's going on. If it works, it will work. If it doesn't work, it won't work on its own terms. And so the courts, a reasonable judge could say, well, my decision in favor of letting this thing continue will have no ultimate detrimental effects. If this thing works, it'll be for the good of the country. If it fails, well, we'll be where we were before. I won't have created an immediate crisis, right? So it, can, it, it is doable, but it can't be done overnight. And therefore, it requires a few steps to be put in in a proper sequence. And then you have to get back to this initial question that I wrote. Why are we here? Well, we're here because of this lack of education and not just the people at the lower level of the, of the economy, you know, the average person who never thinks about the significance of a Federal Reserve note. Wait a minute, he's got a credit card. You don't even, you don't even think about the banking system. Right? <clears throat> But at the higher levels, the lawyers, the economists, the people that will tell you to your face, oh, no, you can't use, you can't make a contract payable in anything but Federal Reserve notes in this country. And I'm telling you, they're out there. And not just politicians, I mean, not just lawyers who are you know, on the periphery of the you know, political world, 
But you're practicing lawyers, you're economists, teaching, teaching a company, a professor, Professor Smith or whatever. And I run into them, literally, I run into them, they tell me this to my face. And I say, here's the statute, go read it. I never heard of that. Oh, you never heard of that? Then why the heck are you here talking, giving a talk on it? Why are you filling the audience with this baloney? Well, you can't make a contract except in Federal Reserve notes. Federal Reserve notes are the only legal tender. What's the matter with you? Haven't you ever read the statute? You haven't read the statute? What are you doing? You shouldn't be here giving a lecture. Now, this is not to criticize Professor Smith. Poor guy. He probably went to Harvard the way I did. Right? And he, they didn't bother to tell him about this. And you know who who's an example to, who was it? Um, the fellow that was up for the Supreme Court way back when, and they, they nixed him. It was Bork. And the reason I'm bringing this up was that was one of the questions that they asked him. What decisions of the Supreme Court did he think were wrong? Okay, they were trying to trip him up. And the one that he picked out was the Knox versus Lee of Julia versus Greenman. These two decisions of the Supreme Court that upheld the constitutionality of the irredeemable United States notes of the Civil War. And he said, yeah, those are probably wrong. They are. They're, they're grotesquely wrong. They're ridiculous. They're political decisions. Because they wanted the claim was basically that the Civil War wouldn't have been won by the Union if the Union hadn't been able to use irredeemable paper currency, and therefore it must be constitutional. But of course, the Confederacy used irredeemable paper currency too at lost. So what is that going to tell you? I mean, really, it's, it's baloney. You read the opinion, it's all nonsense, okay? But he said, these opinions were completely wrong, but there's nothing we can do about them. He wanted to cover his rear end, right? I'm not going to go in there and declare anything in, invalid with respect to the banks. There's nothing we can do about them. And actually, he, his name came up again in my experience. I was talking to a fellow who took his constitutional law class, Bork's constitutional law class. And he was a fellow that, um, the student, who knew a little bit about the real history of money and banking. And so he asked Professor Bork at the time, are we in your class, I think it was constitutional law, in fact, are we going to cover, are we going to discuss these post-Civil War monetary decisions of the Supreme Court. And Bork said, oh, no, no, we're not going to waste any time on that. That's all water over the dam. <laughs> well, there you go. All right, it's water, over, it's water over the dam. They're destroying the country. This is, this is a system that cannot maintain itself. It's inherently unstable. In one guise or another, it has failed throughout the history of the United States. And here are Supreme Court decisions that uphold the supposed legitimacy of the irredeemable paper currency, which is being used as the substrate, if you will, of this banking system. But nobody's going to challenge that. Nobody, and not even challenge it. Because we're talking about the, the, the challenge that he said would not happen when he was being nominated for the Supreme Court. But he wasn't even going to discuss it in his constitutional law class. Heaven forfend that anyone would leave his constitutional law class believing that the Supreme Court decisions were wrong and that the Federal Reserve System is unconstitutional. Well, there you go. And Bork was upheld by the, what will I call them? I don't know, right wingers, conservative, whatever they, you know, whatever label you want to give them. He was upheld by them or praised by them as a strict constructionist. Remember that? This was the guy, oh, that's why the, the, the people who opposed him didn't want him on the Supreme Court. Because he was a strict constructionist, heaven knows, he would be unraveling a lot of the things that came out of the Roosevelt era. But he damn well wasn't going to go back and try to unravel something that came out of the Abraham Lincoln era. All right? Which was more important, really, because anything Roosevelt did was dependent upon the existence of this creature, the Federal Reserve System, which had been come up under Wilson, and that was dependent upon the national currency system, which had come up under Lincoln. So that's why I get to education. It's not simply ma and pa kettle. And you say, well, right, where, where would you expect them to learn anything about this? Right? In public school? When teachers are members of the National Education Association? Would you expect them to be teaching? Of course not. But what about Harvard Law School? <laughs> so that's our problem. So this has to come out of, I think it has to come out of some activist types at the state level. And then they have to have a vision of where they're going with this, each step in the process. 
And I think a lot of these steps could be put in fairly quickly. The legal tender uh, provision, con uh, the uh, control of the state courts, what, how are they going to deal with this thing? Uh, that could be done in one statute. That would be the revivification of gold clause contracts, period. This is how we get gold clause contracts back as legal mechanisms. Now, the next step is we have to provide an institutional structure so that people can use these kinds of contracts. If they're not just theoretical, but they become practical instruments. And that's the state depository system. And then the state involvement through some sort of circular flow, taxation, because you can force people into that, taxation on the one hand and paying out to creditors on the other hand. And then the next level, which is the militia function, we want to bring people, not just the ones who are very knowledgeable, not just the people who are attuned as it were already attuned to the value of gold cost contracts, but we want to bring potentially everyone in our economy into this. So we say, well, you have to get an account. You have to get this payment card or whatever app or whatever, whatever it would be, you know, right? Highest level of technology. You have to get this because you remember the militia and this is part of our economic security package. You don't have to use it. We're not going to force you to do anything with it. It's up to you. But we're giving you the ability which you never had before. And then we add to that the fact that this is a militia function, and therefore we're giving you the legal protection from interference by some alphabet agency in Washington. And then we see what happens. And if the proponents of you know, free market economics are correct, then sound money will defeat unsound money. You'll have the reversal of Gresham's law. When people get to choose sound money over unsound money, they will choose sound money simply because they're reasoning people, right? And if they're not, well, then we're living in you know an era of unreason, and everything will collapse and go to hell without the handbasket even. But I'm willing to accept the proposition still that if you give the people a choice between dinner at Maxime's and a rotting cabbage, they will go to dinner at Maxime's. Yep. Yeah, that, that, that choice. I mean, we've seen that. I just wanted to wrap up here because we are out of time, but there's about four things I just want to touch on as we, as we do. Uh, you've given us a very compelling, uh, I guess a roadmap, a cookbook that those who really want to see truth and constitutionality returned. And frankly, what we'll talk about what this is, it's actually restoring hope for our futures because, uh, people, in order to have hope that there's that they can save for their own future and that of their children and grandchildren need to know that the, that the species in which they're doing their savings is something that's going to last uh the test of time and not be just capriciously you know just stolen away by uh by rule makers so first of all the principle you've been uh, uh really reminding us of, is the freedom of choice brings puts power back in the hands of the individuals. And we've seen that when people look for school choice. We've looked at whenever uh, monopolies are broken up because there needs to be a free marketplace for people to be able to elect what is going to be better for them and for their future and, and be free to do that. Uh, we the, a good example. Uh, we've had a, we've had James Rawls on. He's the founder of survivalblog.com. He's also the owner of Elk Creek Company. If people want to go to elkcreekcompany.net, they can see uh, antique firearms that he has listed for sale in uh, the quantity of pre-1965 silver. That's the primary price that's posted. And there's an alternate price in Federal Reserve notes that changes all the time. And he says over time, it's remarkable how the price, how stable the price is in silver and uh, how unstable the price is and keeps going up and up in Federal Reserve notes. So people check that out. Also, when you talked about uh, a gold clause for contracts, we just recently uh, re interviewed Keith Weiner, the founder of Monetary Metals. And I'll put a link in the description for that interview where he talks about right now, today, people can uh, lease their gold basically uh, through a gold a lease and through a gold bond and get paid back in gold and um that that uh, it's a way to generate yield 
off of your existing gold that is paid back in gold. Uh, also, you talked to us about the principle of grassroots being the way to do it rather than sort of this big bang top down approach that can be fraught with, you know, upsetting the whole apple cart in a way that's convulsive and, and um, uh, destructive to do this constructive, organic uh, sort of state level. And, and I guess that principle is, is, again, restoring power to the states and using the, the strength of the Constitution and the original intention of our founders to bring things up from the, from the grassroots level. The only thing that um, I had to kind of uh, scratch my head about was that thing about it's too complex to do this. That's why the overnight legislation would never do it because it's got too many tentacles and it's too big. And it's like, oh my gosh, the things that have been foisted on us apparently almost overnight, whether it was uh, the Affordable Care Act, quote unquote, Affordable Care Act, or whether it was other things that were, we have to pass this bill so we can find out what's in it and then find out later it was it was just a tax after all or whatever. Um, it, it's amazing that the, the huge and far reaching takeovers of of parts of our freedom that have been foisted on us on something that, that apparently was unveiled in re apparently in response to a need, but had actually been under development for a long time. But the the alternative approach, that sort of that asymmetrical approach, reminds me of sort of the uh, the dark side, the Empire in uh, Star Wars versus the the rebels that are that are just doing what they can do on their local level and in and, and uh, with their feet on the ground. Uh, the people in the states. Uh, can, in fact, start making positive concrete steps that will add up to making a big difference and um, not be convulsive, but be transformative in liberating people to have a, a restoration of freedom and, and freedom of choice, freedom of their future restored. Dr. Vieira, inspiring as always, remind people about the book that you wrote, Pieces of Eight, where they can find that. Well, all of my books are available on Amazon. And quite a few of my short articles are available at newswithviews.com. And there actually is a long uh, talk that I gave to a group of uh, staffers, House of Representative staff personnel, dealing with the what I call the overview of American monetary and coinage history. It goes on for about two hours. So they shouldn't have difficulty in finding that. I can't remember exactly what the title is, but there's only one of them out there. And that will take them from the colonial period up through today in terms of the devolution, if you will, of the American monetary and coin system. Then they won't have to read a 1,700-page book that I wrote. <laughs> well, we're grateful for your presence here. As always, whenever we have you here, our commenters underneath the video say, how soon can you have Dr. Vieira back? So, and just this morning, I think I emailed you on another topic that we want to have you back on as soon as we can. But thank you again for being with us today and helping to clarify that, in fact, we do have the power at the state level to actually make a gold and silver economy work and make it stick uh, and restore the original intention that put the power in the hands of the people. Dr. Vieira, thanks for joining us again on Liberty and Finance. Well, thank you for having me, right. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us Discuss your needs, and we will let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by Bankwire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be double boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly 
with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Elijah, my brother Kaiser, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.